Check it out guys, oil and refrigerant are spraying all over my car. I'm here in front of the car and typically what you want to do when you replace the condenser is drain all the oil out. However much oil you can get out of the old condenser is how much you want to put in the new condenser. However, because this car was in an accident, we don't know how much oil was in there and I think all the old uh, oil just leaked down onto the ground. And I just put a couple ounces of this in the, in the condenser. This is where a lot of the damage occurs. The more these lines get taken apart, the more they get scratched. It's really important that when you, when you try to disconnect it, you disconnect it straight, straight off. So you want to try to wiggle it. Don't pull it to one side or anything or else it's going to scratch on the inside. Um, it is easier to remove some of the lines to install the O-rings. For example, this O-ring here goes down to my compressor and there's no way I can get all the way down there to install the O-ring. So uh, I went ahead and disconnected it here and down at the compressor and I just pulled the entire line out. This line here and then it goes down to my dryer and that was a lot easier as well just to remove it. So once I removed it, you know, there's a lot less chance of me scratching the, uh, the ceiling surfaces and, and to keep it clean as well. I'll show you guys, it's actually working really good. It's kind of noisy in here, sorry about that. The vacuum pump is going. So I showed you guys in the last video that I don't rely on this gauge. So it just doesn't have the resolution to see a leak. So I use this one here. This is a micron gauge, it shows units in microns. And after initial initialization, it'll show the microns. So last time I saw it, it was 720 microns, which is really good. You want to get it as low as possible with the vacuum pump. So I'm not using this hose here. It's just kind of sitting there. I'm actually pulling a vacuum on the high side, and I have the car off right now, and I'm just trying to work on the lines, so it doesn't really matter where I pull a vacuum from. So I'm pulling a vacuum from the high side, and then I'm going to fill it with this side here, the low side, because those are just the connections that I have. So I was originally pulling a vacuum over here, and then I switched just so I can put the uh, Freon on the low side. It says that you should try to vacuum it down to 250 microns and then isolate the system. You do that here by switching the, the valve. And then if the if the pressure on the micron gauge goes to above a thousand microns and holds steady, uh, then you have moisture in the system. If it goes above 2,000 microns, then you have a leak. So the main spec that I use is the 2,000 micron spec. Um, I definitely pay attention to that one. I don't want to leak, and this one is holding steady at about 1400 microns. So it's not that I don't care about moisture. I do care about moisture, but I think where it settles isn't as important as a leak. So there is there is desiccant in the system, and that's the purpose of the dryer, but I've never seen a car system stabilize below a thousand microns. But as you can see, this thing works in microns. You, it has the resolution, whereas this thing does not. So if you go to an AC guy, and this is all he has, his analog gauges, and he's not capable of seeing down in the microns, then you may want to go to a different AC guy or just do it yourself. Unfortunately, I have a leak. This connector, I don't know if you guys can hear it, It's leaking and it's just a Schrader valve just like a bicycle tire or a car tire uh, but my tools don't go down that deep so that's typically what I use for Schrader valves but you can see there's no way it's gonna get down there low enough so well it looks like I got to do this all over again 
I gotta either tighten that shredder, shredder valve or replace it. I'm back from the store now and I have a couple tools. I've got this, I got this at AutoZone. This is for the uh, Schrader valve. And the reason why we use nitrogen is because it's clean and dry. Unlike air, if you use compressed air, then there's a lot of moisture in the air and you'll get moisture in your lines. And then you're gonna basically start from scratch with your vacuum gauge. Here we are, I'm gonna increase the pressure. It doesn't have to be anything drastic. I just wanna hear the leak. I can hear it already and it's not even showing up on my gauge yet. My uh, $5 Schrader valve tool just broke. I think the right thing to do here is just to vacuum it all over again and to refill it with Freon. I got my AC clutch in today and I wanted to show you guys how I got the, the center nut off. What I did, I just stuck my foot on it to kind of hold it a little bit. I hammered the handle just a little bit and it came off pretty easily. So this is the second time I've taken a clutch off and both of them came off pretty easy. They're really not torqued on very much. So no high power tools here, just a little bit of uh, backwoods ingenuity and it came right off. Here I am, I got my foot on it. I'm using my three-way jaw pullers and it feels like it's coming right off. All right, I got the coil off and I wanted to show you guys the resistance here of the coil. I've got it hooked up to my ohm meter and I'm sitting at about three ohms. And on the new coil, I have the exact same thing. So I really didn't have to replace it. I should have done this to begin with. Yeah, this one has three ohms and the new one also has three ohms. And I also bought a new tool just to get this off. So really I could have kept this part, which is the coil on the car and just replaced the, uh, the clutch mechanism. In addition to that, there's also a hack which allows people to not replace anything and just to grind down the surface of the AC clutch. So if your clutch is no longer working, what you can do is grind down this surface right here and that allows the entire clutch to be closer to the opposite side of the clutch. But since I thought my coil was bad, I went ahead and got a whole new kit and it looks like it wasn't necessary. However, I still don't know what the issue was because it just wasn't responding electrically. You know, I would short it out to the battery and there was absolutely no click, no anything. So that made me think that everything was bad. Here's the jaws here. And I had to grind that off just to get better access to the clip inside. The next part of the AC clutch went on pretty well. And you can see the clip in the middle is already installed. I went ahead and used my old clutch and hammered against that. And at the last part, it just fell right into place. From what I've seen online is that most people are adjusting the gap between the clutch plate and the, and the, the pulley here. Um, there needs to be a gap of 0 0.013 inch. Install the washers and then torque this down and see if it rubs against your pulley. If it rubs against the pulley, add another shim and torque it down. Keep doing that process until it no longer rubs against your pulley and then you have the gap set correctly. I got the new AC clutch installed and I wanted to show you guys what it sounds like when I short out the clutch directly to the battery. So if you don't hear that sound and your clutch is not working or it's not touching. So I'm not really sure what was the problem before. It's Well, I messed up guys. There's actually a thermal switch on the compressor itself. And where I was testing, I, I didn't notice it. So uh, I, I thought it was the, the clutch. So now when I test it here, it still doesn't work. And here it does work so I really can't tell you if the clutch was good or bad before I can tell you this part right here is about $50 on the internet and a lot of people have bypassed it so they'll just they'll just hardwire it straight from here to here and I know that's gonna get the AC working so it's debatable about what to do here guys a new compressor 
can run hundreds of dollars. I think if I go directly to the dealer, it's probably about seven hundred dollars, and an aftermarket one is probably about two fifty, maybe maybe three hundred dollars. I know that the compressor feels smooth, and I can rotate uh, the compressor by hand, and everything feels good. So I know it's going to work, but I just don't know how long. So as shady as this sounds, I'm just going to bypass the switch. Here's my quick soldering job, and the switch has been bypassed. And I want to let you guys know I did try to remove the thermal switch out of the compressor housing, but that thing just was not coming out. So yeah, I was drilling it, chipping at it, doing whatever I could to it, and it's just not coming out. So uh, I think the only way to really replace it is to replace the entire compressor. Check this out. The newly installed trader valve is leaking. I don't, I don't know what happened here. I was inside the house and all of a sudden I heard, you know, some noise. I came outside and it was like a fire hydrant. This is oil and Freon going all over the car. There's nothing I can do about it. I just have to let the system bleed out into the atmosphere. I do have Schrader valve tools uh, for houses, but not for cars. And this was totally unexpected. For a house, I am able to plug up the hole exchange the valve without the Freon leaking into the atmosphere, but I don't have such tools for cars. Well guys, I feel like a dumbass because I had my Schrader valve loose and I know I tightened it before, but I just tightened it another rotation and uh, it stopped leaking. So I'm assuming that Schrader valve is okay and I uh, went ahead and connected my lines and I'm check checking out the pressures. And this doesn't look good at all. In fact, uh, got some Freon coming out right now because it's too high. So, so you can see how high it is. I was up to 300 PSI and I still had nothing over here. You know, I barely had like 25. So uh, that's definitely an indication that I have a blockage in the line, probably with the expansion valve. And um, the expansion valve is not fun to get to. The AC lines come over here, and it goes down below the glove box on the inside of the car. And uh, it's really a pain in the butt to get into. So this AC project, air conditioning project, just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So, yeah, it's not fun. Good morning, guys. It's about 15 degrees outside right now, and uh, today's project is going to be the expansion valve. Woo! Fun! Anytime you guys deal with uh, an expansion valve, it's a pain in the butt. So, in this case, in this Honda Civic, it is deep in the dash. I have to rip apart the dash and go under the uh, the glove box. I'm going to be working upside down at times. And um, it's not fun, especially when it's uh, 15 degrees. So it's supposed to be about 30 in the middle of the day. But, you know, hopefully if I keep working and working well, I'll stay warm. Wish me luck. With part of the air intake assembly removed, this big box here, remove that. Now you have access to the expansion valve bolt, which is right there. Let's see if I can, there it is. Follow the two aluminum tubes in and in between the two, you can see that bolt. So we'll have to loosen that and that will loosen the assembly from inside the car. Got the air box out with a little finesse, a little bit of wiggling. But this has a cabin air filter and I didn't know that. So that's kind of cool. Now you can see where the TXV valve is at the end, at the right side of this aluminum hose. The uh, TXV valve is there, but this plastic piece here has to come out. I think that's just held in with screws. We'll slide out the evaporator and then the TXV is at the end of that. You just move the wires out of the way and then it'll slide right out. There it is. And here's our valve here. So I'm going to take it off, see if there's any O-rings on it, and if I need to run down to the dealer. Boom, that was fast, right? 
I just came back from the Honda dealer and I got four O-rings for the H valve or for the expansion valve. And these two are the same and these two are different. So if you guys want to write down the part numbers, there they are. Also, I got the new valve itself. I got this one from Amazon and it had good reviews. I just, I typically just look at the reviews on Amazon and if it's around four or five stars, then I'll go ahead and order that one. We got our cabin air filters in and now it's time to put in the air box and get this thing back on the ground. Good morning and welcome back to the never ending Honda Civic problem project. So I got the uh, AC vacuumed out again last night. Uh, I went ahead and put it just a little bit of Freon in it just to put some pressure in it. And I wanted to adjust the levels today with the car running and the, and the door open. But it is 22 degrees out here today. And I'm a little worried that the AC is not going to function properly in this cold weather. So the expansion valve has a little cavity. Let me find it here. The expansion valve has a cavity, this thing on top. And when it gets hot, it expands and closes the valve or opens it. And as you can see here, this expansion valve is not clogged. There's no debris in it. So my theory is that this thing is just stuck and I want to try to heat the top up and maybe blow through the hole and see what happens. I know this isn't very scientific, but just hear me out. Let's give it a shot. I'm going to blow through it. It's somewhat restricted, but not totally. And uh, I'm going to try to heat it up now and see if there's a difference. I'm going to give it a blow. Yeah, it definitely opened up. It, it appears that the old H valve or expansion valve was working. And so I don't know, maybe, maybe it just wasn't working well enough. Well, I do know that the system calls for about 500 grams of refrigerant. And this is 340, so I've already put in like a half a can of refrigerant, so I believe it needs another can. And so I'm going to put it in a can and go from there and see how it works. But I don't know, I might have to call a professional or, or something on this one. But, you know, I've been looking online, I've been looking at videos, and I don't see anybody doing AC work in cold weather or what to do in cold weather because... People still use the AC in cold weather. That's how people use the defrost. The defrost dries the air for the windshield. Um, so it's absolutely needed on a regular basis, either in the winter and in the summer. And if I want to sell this car in the winter, then I got to try to get it working. So, well, let's see what happens. You know, maybe this new expansion valve is working better than the old one. I'll put some Freon in it, run the system, see what happens. Hey, good morning guys. I got the air box in, I got the, the system charged, and I was driving around and I was actually going to the Air Force Base to go to the hobby shop. But when I was going there, I actually tried the air conditioning and it was ice cold. So I, I kind of did a detour, decided, you know, I'm pretty much done with this AC. I ended up checking on my rental properties instead of going to the hobby shop. All right guys, I got the Honda back in the garage and I have the wheels off because I replaced the fender liners. Uh, I also have the car up on jack stand so I can remove the exhaust manifold for welding and I have it here and oh my goodness is this a welder? Woohoo! I got the Harbor Freight super cheapy Chicago Electric Flux 125 welder and you guys I haven't welded since I was in high school so I don't know that's like 30 years ago right? And I'm going to give it a shot. So. Here's my welding job, guys. And it looks disgusting, I know. So, you can see here, I had a practice run and I did okay. So, I do believe that the crack is covered. Most of this is going to be covered by the heat shield, so I'm not too worried about it. And then... Once the rust starts settling in, you know, it's re you're really not going to see much of a difference. I am not a welder, 
you know, I guess uh, everything you see on YouTube doesn't make you an expert, unfortunately. Um, also, uh, you know, I did get some good welds out of it, but I, I just got a lot, I got very frustrated because every time I would do a good weld, it wasn't where I wanted it to be. It was basically my practice weld and not my final weld. So I would go back and, uh, you know, I would add too much, too little, I would make a hole, I'd have to turn it down, add some metal, and I kept going back and forth. Uh, in the end, I did, I do think I had some good welds. However, um, my manifold cracked as soon as I put it on. So, um, huge disappointment there. And I'll show you what happened here. Let me turn the camera around. Hey guys, here's my manifold. And I don't know if it's coming through on the camera, but it, it appears to me that this thing is warped and it's coming down on this side. When I torqued it down on this side, I heard a crack and I was very afraid that I broke my bolt uh, or the stud or something. Um, wasn't sure what was going on. I started it up and obviously this thing was so loud. It was, uh, you know, much louder than before. So I came over here to investigate and I saw that the crack had reopened. And I know this isn't a very good weld, you know, that's obvious, but it wasn't supposed to be a strong weld. It was, it was just supposed to be some metal over a crack to plug it up, basically. So I'm gonna try to take it back, guys. And if, if I can't take it back, I, don't know, I might just try to sell it on Facebook or Craigslist or something, so. I got my catalytic converter in. I wonder how the UPS guy feels when people answer the door in their pajamas. I just noticed that there is a dent on the exhaust manifold and I wanted to show you guys why. So you can see here, they did a good job in packing the, the box in a box. That's usually how, you know, good packing is, but they didn't put enough padding between the boxes. So, and of course they always throw around the boxes and here we have a dent here. So that's not good. It's been two days later and I have the replacement part. So you can see again, they put in very little padding. The end piece has been hitting the, the side here. So they didn't do anything to prevent damage, but luckily this one is not damaged. Exhaust manifold is working pretty good, uh, but it was not a very good fit. And it's normal for it to smoke when the parts heat up. So I'm not worried about it. Uh, but this one was a little bit too close to the to the engine block and I actually had to bend it out a little bit and hopefully it's not going to crack in the future. I took my handle to my ratchet and I, I bent it out just a little bit away from the block. Um, also, also I want to tell you guys that you can put the heat shield on the manifold before putting it on the car and that would make, make it a lot easier. You can see I do have access to all the manifold bolts and there's one in the corner down here as well but yeah you do have access to all the manifold bolts so put the heat shield on first before putting it on the car here's the end results guys it's kind of anticlimactic i know but it is what it is the catalytic converter is working okay there's no checking in check engine light or anything on um it's quiet as it should be and um I do have to say that it, you know, the engine is looking better. So there's not as much oil dripping down as it as there used to be. It's a little shinier. Um, unfortunately, it's still a 2001 Honda Civic. Other cars of this year have timing chains, and this one has a timing belt. So even though the Honda Civic is considered a reliable car, it still has a timing belt in this year. So it's, uh, it's okay, you know, this is a good college car, good college student car, it's reliable and everything. Um, it's a little noisier and a little rough. The suspension is stiff and, you know, on this car, the struts need to be replaced. It's a little rougher than I would like it and a little rougher than stock, so, but I'm not gonna invest any more into it. If it was mine, I probably would replace the struts the brakes and tint the windows and replace the transmission maybe it seems to be slipping just a little bit so that's it guys it's a wrap and i'll probably replace this car um in a few months so uh, as i was saying in other videos we're in the process of getting a foreclosure 
And once we're settled with those two houses, we'll look at Copart again and get another car to flip and maybe even one for myself. So wish me luck, guys. So I got to talk about the elephant in the room, okay? So I am obviously wasting my time, wasting my money on this Honda Civic. So uh, I do consider myself a real estate guy. I love real estate. And I do occasionally like to get my hands dirty, either on cars or on houses. And my wife and I both have noted that this is just a, a time waster. Even after work, I would go home, pack up the truck and the trailer, and I would shoot down to the house and, and start renovating it. And it almost seems like with the same amount of effort, I could have had an asset. I could have had another house built that actually generates monthly income for me. So right now we have 12 houses and I feel right now like I'm not like I'm not doing anything. Why am I wasting my time on this crap? But I do want to let you guys know that I'm always interested in real estate. This is just kind of like a time waster while I wait or while I work on real estate. And it takes time. So if you go out and bid on a foreclosure, then you have like 30 days, 40 days, something like that to, to get that house. And especially if you have to do an eviction, it could be 60, maybe even 90 days until you get the house. So I don't regret staying busy, but I do know that I should have spent my time more wisely. For example, I do have a bathroom project in the basement and I probably could have been nearly done with that project by now if I wasn't working on cars. I wanna urge everybody who's in the same situation as me you know, if you have cars and cars are your lifeblood, let's say you're a mechanic or something like that, that's cool. Don't change what you're doing. You got to put food on the table, but you should always recognize the long-term goals, long-term wealth and doing something for your family. Especially if you are handy, you should be out there buying real estate and have those alternate sources of income coming in every month for you and your family. Don't waste your time in the cold garage, working, slaving every day just to get another car next week or next month. So if you're handy, make the switch from cars to real estate. Make that time and your money work for you and you'll have assets and you'll have fun and you can see monumental changes in your efforts.